Chapter Twenty Two of Ruth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cynthia Lyons. Ruth by Elizabeth Cleghorn Gaskell. Chapter Twenty Two The Liberal Candidate and His Precursor. Jemima did not know whether she wished to go to Abermouth or not. She longed for change. She wearied of the sights and sounds of home. But yet she could not bear to leave the neighbourhood of Mr. Farquhar, especially as, if she went to Abermouth, Ruth would in all probability be left to take her holiday at home. When Mr. Bradshaw decided that she was to go, Ruth tried to feel glad that he gave her the means of repairing her fault towards Elizabeth, and she resolved to watch over the two girls most faithfully and carefully, and to do all in her power to restore the invalid to health. But a tremor came over her whenever she thought of leaving Leonard. She had never quitted him for a day, and it seemed to her as if her brooding constant care was his natural and necessary shelter from all evils, from very death itself. She would not go to sleep at nights in order to enjoy the blessed consciousness of having him near her. When she was away from him teaching her pupils, she kept trying to remember his face, and print it deep on her heart against the time when days and days would elapse without her seeing that little darling countenance. Miss Benson would wonder to her brother that Mr. Bradshaw did not propose that Leonard should accompany his mother. He only begged her not to put such an idea into Ruth's head, as he was sure Mr. Bradshaw had no thoughts of doing any such thing. Yet to Ruth it might be a hope, and then a disappointment. His sister scolded him for being so cold-hearted, but he was full of sympathy, although he did not express it, and made some quiet little sacrifices in order to set himself at liberty to take Leonard a long walking expedition on the day when his mother left Eccleston. Ruth cried until she could cry no longer, and felt very much ashamed of herself as she saw the grave and wondering looks of her pupils, whose only feeling on leaving home was delight at the idea of Abermouth, and into whose minds the possibility of death to any of their beloved ones never entered. Ruth dried her eyes and spoke cheerfully as soon as she caught the perplexed expression of their faces, and by the time they arrived at Abermouth she was as much delighted with all the new scenery as they were, and found it hard work to resist their entreaties to go rambling out on the seashore at once. But Elizabeth had undergone more fatigue that day than she had had before for many weeks, and Ruth was determined to be prudent. Meanwhile, the Bradshaw's house at Eccleston was being rapidly adapted for electioneering hospitality. The partition wall between the unused drawing-room and the schoolroom was broken down in order to admit of folding doors. The ingenious upholsterer of the town, and what town does not boast of the upholsterer full of contrivances and resources in opposition to the upholsterer of steady capital and no imagination, who looks down with uneasy contempt on ingenuity, had come in to give his opinion that nothing could be easier than to convert a bathroom into a bedroom by the assistance of a little drapery to conceal the shower-bath, the string of which was to be carefully concealed, for fear that the unconscious occupier of the bath-bed might innocently take it for a bell-rope. The professional cook of the town had been already engaged to take up her abode for a month at Mr. Bradshaw's much to the indignation of Betsy, who became a vehement partisan of Mr. Cranworth. As soon as ever she heard of the plan of her deposition from sovereign authority in the kitchen, in which she had reigned supreme for fourteen years, Mrs. Bradshaw sighed and bemoaned herself in all her leisure moments, 
which were not many, and wondered why their house was to be turned into an inn for this Mr. Dunn, when everybody knew that the George was good enough for the Cranworths, who never thought of asking the electors to the hall. And they had lived at Cranworth ever since Julius Caesar's time, and if that was not being an old family she did not know what was. The excitement soothed Jemima. There was something to do. It was she who planned with the upholsterer. It was she who soothed Betsy into angry silence. It was she who persuaded her mother to lie down and rest, while she herself went out to buy the heterogeneous things required to make the family and house presentable to Mr. Dunn and his precursor, the friend of the parliamentary agent. This latter gentleman never appeared himself on the scene of action, but pulled all the strings notwithstanding. The friend was a Mr. Hickson, a lawyer, a briefless barrister, some people called him, but he himself professed a great disgust to the law as a great sham, which involved an immensity of underhanded action, and truckling and time-serving, and was perfectly encumbered by useless forms and ceremonies, and dead obsolete words. So, instead of putting his shoulder to the wheel to reform the law, he talked eloquently against it, in such a high priest's style that it was occasionally a matter of surprise how he could ever have made a friend of the parliamentary agent before mentioned. But, as Mr. Hickson himself said, it was the very corruptness of the law which he was fighting against in doing all he could to effect the return of certain members to Parliament, these certain members being pledged to effect a reform in the law, according to Mr. Hickson. And, as he once observed confidentially, if you had to destroy a hydra-headed monster, would you measure swords with the demon as if he were a gentleman? Would you not rather seize the first weapon that came to hand? And so do I. My great object in life, sir, is to reform the law of England, sir. Once get a majority of liberal members into the house, and the thing is done. And I consider myself justified for so high, for, I may say, so holy an end, in using men's weaknesses to work out my purpose. Of course, if men were angels, or even immaculate, men invulnerable to bribes, we would not bribe. Could you ask Jemima, for the conversation took place at Mr. Bradshaw's dinner-table, where a few friends were gathered together to meet Mr. Hickson, and among them was Mr. Benson? We neither would nor could, said the ardent barrister, disregarding in his vehemence the point of the question, and floating on over the bar of argument into the wide ocean of his own eloquence. As it is, as the world stands, they who would succeed even in good deeds must come down to the level of expediency, and therefore, I say once more, if Mr. Dunn is the man for your purpose, and your purpose is a good one, a lofty one, a holy one, for Mr. Hickson remembered the dissenting character of his little audience, and privately considered the introduction of the word holy a most happy hit, then, I say, we must put all the squeamish scruples which might befit Utopia, or some such place, on one side, and treat men as they are. If they are avaricious, it is not we who have made them so, but as we have to do with them, we must consider their failings in dealing with them. If they had been careless or extravagant, or have had their little peccadilloes, we must administer the screw. The glorious reform of the law will justify, in my idea, all means to obtain the end. That law, from the profession of which I have withdrawn myself from perhaps a too scrupulous conscience, he concluded softly to himself. We are not to do evil that good may come, said Mr. Benson. He was startled at the deep sound of his own voice as he uttered these words. But he had not been speaking for some time, and his voice came forth strong and unmodulated. "'True, sir, most true,' said Mr. Hickson, bowing. 
I honour you for the observation. And he profited by it in so much that he confined his further remarks on elections to the end of the table, where he sat near Mr. Bradshaw, and one or two equally eager, though not equally influential partisans of Mr. Dunn's. Meanwhile, Mr. Farquhar took up Mr. Benson's quotation at the end where he and Jemima sat down near to Mrs. Bradshaw and him. But in the present state of the world, as Mr. Hickson says, it is rather difficult to act upon that precept. Oh, Mr. Farquhar, said Jemima indignantly, the tears springing to her eyes with a feeling of disappointment for she had been chafing under all that Mr. Hickson had been saying, perhaps the more for one or two attempts on his part at flirtation with the daughter of his wealthy host, which she resented with all the loathing of her preoccupied heart, and she had longed to be a man to speak out her wrath at this paltering with right and wrong. She had felt grateful to Mr. Benson for his one clear short precept, coming down with a divine force against which there was no appeal, and now to have Mr. Farquhar taking the side of expediency. It was too bad. "'Nay, Jemima,' said Mr. Farquhar, touched and secretly flattered by the visible pain his speech had given. "'Don't be indignant with me till I, I have explained myself a little more. I don't understand myself yet, and it is a very intricate question, or so it appears to me, which I was going to put, really, earnestly and humbly, for Mr. Benson's opinion. Now, Mr. Benson, may I ask if you always find it practicable to act strictly in accordance with that principle? For, if you do not, I am sure no man living can. Are there not occasions when it is absolutely necessary to wade through evil to good? I am not speaking in the careless, presumptuous way of that man yonder," said he, lowering his voice and addressing himself to Jemima more exclusively. I am really anxious to hear what Mr. Benson will say on the subject, for I know no one to whose candid opinion I should attach more weight. But Mr. Benson was silent. He did not see Mrs. Bradshaw and Jemima leave the room. He was really, as Mr. Farquhar supposed him, completely absent, questioning himself as to how far his practice tallied with his principle. By degrees he came to himself. He found the conversation still turned on the election, and Mr. Hickson, who felt that he had jarred against the little minister's principles, and yet knew, from the carte du pays which the scouts of the parliamentary agent had given him, that Mr. Benson was a person to be conciliated, on account of his influence over many of the working people, began to ask him questions with an air of deferring to superior knowledge that almost surprised Mr. Bradshaw, who had been accustomed to treat Benson in a very different fashion, of civil condescending indulgence, just as one listens to a child who can have no opportunities of knowing better. At the end of a conversation that Mr. Hickson held with Mr. Benson, on a subject in which the latter was really interested, and on which he had expressed himself at some length, the young barrister turned to Mr. Bradshaw and said very audibly, "'I wish Dunn had been here. This conversation during the last half-hour would have interested him almost as much as it has done me." Mr. Bradshaw little guessed the truth that Mr. Dunn was, at that very moment, coaching up the various subjects of public interest at Eccleston, and privately cursing the particular subject on which Mr. Benson had been holding forth, as being an unintelligible piece of quixotism or the leading dissenter of the town need not have experienced a pang of jealousy at the possible future admiration his minister might excite in the possible future member for Eccleston. And if Mr. Benson had been clairvoyant, he need not have made an especial subject of gratitude 
out of the likelihood that he might have an opportunity of so far interesting mr dunn in the condition of the people of eccleston as to induce him to set his face against any attempts at bribery mr benson thought of this half the night through and ended by determining to write a sermon on the christian view of political duties which might be good for all both electors and member to hear on the eve of an election for mr dunn was expected at mr bradshaw's before the next sunday and of course as mr and miss benson had settled it he would appear at the chapel with them on that day but the stinging conscience refused to be quieted no present plan of usefulness allayed the aching remembrance of the evil he had done that good might come not even the look of leonard as the early dawn fell on him and mr benson's sleepless eyes saw the rosy glow on his firm round cheeks his open mouth through which the soft long-drawn breath came gently quivering and his eyes not fully shut but closed to outward sight not even the aspect of the quiet innocent child could soothe the troubled spirit leonard and his mother dreamt of each other that night her dream of him was one of undefined terror terror so great that it wakened her up and she strove not to sleep again for fear that ominous ghastly dream should return he on the contrary dreamt of her sitting watching and smiling by his bedside as her gentle self had been many a morning and when she saw him awake so it fell out in the dream she smiled still more sweetly and bending down she kissed him and then spread out large soft white feathered wings which in no way surprised her child he seemed to have known they were there all along and sailed away through the open window far into the blue sky of a summer's day leonard wakened up then and remembered how far away she really was far more distant and inaccessible than the beautiful blue sky to which she had betaken herself in his dream and cried himself to sleep again in spite of her absence from her child which made one great and abiding sorrow ruth enjoyed her seaside visit exceedingly in the first place there was the delight of seeing elizabeth's daily and almost hourly improvement then at the doctor's express orders there were so few lessons to be done that there was time for the long exploring rambles which all three delighted in and when the rain came on and the storms blew the house with its wild sea views was equally delightful it was a large house built on the summit of a rock which nearly overhung the shore below there was to be sure a series of zigzag tacking paths down the face of this rock but from the house they could not be seen old or delicate people would have considered the situation bleak and exposed indeed the present proprietor wanted to dispose of it on this very account but by its present inhabitants this exposure and bleakness was called by other names and considered as charms from every part of the rooms they saw the grey storms gather on the sea horizon and put themselves in marching array and soon the march became a sweep and the great dome of the heavens was covered with the lurid clouds between which and the vivid green earth below there seemed to come a purple atmosphere making the very threatening beautiful and by and by the house was wrapped in sheets of rain shutting out sky and sea and inland view till of a sudden the storm was gone by and the heavy raindrops glistened in the sun as they hung on leaf and grass and the little birds sang east and the little birds sang west and there was a pleasant sound of running waters all abroad oh if papa would but buy this house exclaimed elizabeth after one such storm which she had watched silently from the very beginning 
of the little cloud no bigger than a man's hand mamma would never like it i am afraid said mary she would call our delicious gushes of air draughts and think we should catch cold jemima would be on our side but how long mrs denby is i hope she was near enough to the post office when the rain came on ruth had gone to the shop in the little village about a half a mile distant where all the letters were left till fetched she only expected one but that one was to tell her of leonard she however received two the unexpected one was from mr bradshaw and the news it contained was if possible a greater surprise than the letter itself mr bradshaw informed her that he planned arriving by dinner-time the following saturday at eagle's crag and more that he intended bringing mr dunn and one or two other gentlemen with him to spend the sunday there the letter went on to give every possible direction regarding the household preparations the dinner hour was fixed to be at six but of course ruth and the girls would have dined long before the professional cook would arrive the day before laden with all the provisions that could not be obtained on the spot ruth was to engage a waiter from the inn and this it was that detained her so long while she sat in the little parlour awaiting the coming of the landlady she could not help wondering why mr bradshaw was bringing this strange gentleman to spend two days at abermouth and thus giving himself so much trouble and fuss of preparation there were so many small reasons that went to make up the large one which had convinced mr bradshaw of the desirableness of this step that it was not likely that ruth should guess at one half of them in the first place miss benson in the pride and fullness of her heart had told mrs bradshaw what her brother had told her how he meant to preach upon the christian view of the duties involved in political rights and as of course mrs bradshaw had told mr bradshaw he began to dislike the idea of attending chapel on that sunday at all for he had an uncomfortable idea that by the christian standard that divine test of the true and pure bribery would not be altogether approved of and yet he was tacitly coming round to the understanding that packets would be required for what purpose both he and mr dunn were to be supposed to remain ignorant but it would be very awkward so near to the time if he were to be clearly convinced that bribery however disguised by names and words was in plain terms a sin and yet he knew mr benson had once or twice convinced him against his will of certain things which he had thenceforward found it impossible to do without such great uneasiness of mind that he had left off doing them which was sadly against his interest and if mr dunn whom he had intended to take with him to chapel as fair dissenting prey should also become convinced why the cranworths would win the day and he should be the laughing-stock of eccleston no in this one case bribery must be allowed was allowable but it was a great pity human nature was so corrupt and if his member succeeded he would double his subscription to the schools in order that the next generation might be taught better there were various other reasons which strengthened mr bradshaw in the bright idea of going down to abermouth for the sunday some connected with the out-of-door politics and some with the domestic for instance it had been the plan of the house to have a cold dinner on the sunday mr bradshaw had piqued himself on this strictness and yet he had instinctive feeling that mr dunn was not quite the man to partake of cold meat for conscience sake with cheerful indifference to his fare mr dunn had in fact taken the bradshaw household a little by surprise before he came mr bradshaw had pleased himself with thinking that more unlikely things had happened than the espousal 
of his daughter with the member of a small borough. But this pretty airy bubble burst as soon as he saw Mr. Dunn, and its very existence was forgotten in less than half an hour, when he felt the quiet but incontestable difference of rank and standard that there was, in every respect, between his guest and his own family. It was not through any circumstance so palpable and possibly accidental as the bringing down a servant who Mr. Dunn seemed to consider as much a matter of course as a carpet-bag, though the smart gentleman's arrival fluttered the Volsians in Corolli considerably more than his gentle-spoken masters. It was nothing like this. It was something indescribable, a quiet being at ease, and expecting every one else to be so an attention to women which was so habitual as to be unconsciously exercised to those subordinate persons in Mr. Bradshaw's family, a happy choice of simple and expressive words, some of which it must be confessed were slang, but fashionable slang, and that makes all the difference, a measured graceful way of utterance, with a style of pronunciation quite different to that of Eccleston. All these put together make but a part of the indescribable whole which unconsciously affected Mr. Bradshaw, and established Mr. Dunn in his estimation as a creature quite different to any he had seen before, and as most unfit to mate with Jemima. Mr. Hickson, who had appeared as a model of gentlemanly ease before Mr. Dunn's arrival, now became vulgar and coarse in Mr. Bradshaw's eyes, and yet such was the charm of that languid, high-bred manner that Mr. Bradshaw cottoned, as he expressed it to Mr. Farquhar, to his new candidate at once. He was only afraid lest Mr. Dunn was too indifferent to all things under the sun to care whether he gained or lost the election but he was reassured after the first conversation they had together on the subject. Mr. Dunn's eye lightened with an eagerness that was almost fierce, though his tones were as musical and nearly as slow as ever, when Mr. Bradshaw alluded distantly to probable expenses and packets. Mr. Dunn replied, "'Oh, of course, disagreeable necessity!' Better speak as little about such things as possible. Other people can be found to arrange all the dirty work. Neither you nor I would like to soil our fingers by it, I am sure. Four thousand pounds are in Mr. Pilson's hands, and I shall never inquire what becomes of them. They may very probably be absorbed in the law expenses, you know. I shall let it be clearly understood from the hustings that I most decidedly disapprove of bribery, and leave the rest to Hickson's management. He is accustomed to these sort of things. I am not. Mr. Bradshaw was rather perplexed by this want of bustling energy on the part of the new candidate, and if it had not been for the four thousand pounds aforesaid, would have doubted whether Mr. Dunn cared sufficiently for the result of the election. Jemima thought differently. She watched her father's visitor attentively, with something like the curious observation which a naturalist bestows on a new species of animal. "'Do you know what Mr. Dunn reminds me of, Mamma? said she one day as the two sat at work while the gentlemen were absent canvassing. "'No, he is not like anybody I ever saw. He quite frightens me. By being so ready to open the door for me, if I am going out of the room, and by giving me a chair when I come in, I never saw any one like him. Who is it, Jemima?' "'Not any person, not any human being, Mamma," said Jemima, half-smiling. "'Do you remember our stopping at Wakefield once on our way to Scarborough? And there were horse-races going on somewhere, and some of the racers were in the stables at the inn where we dined? Yes, I remember it. But what about that? Why, Richard, somehow, 
knew one of the jockeys, and as we were coming in from our ramble throughout the town, this man or boy asked us to look at one of the racers he had the charge of. Well, my dear? Well, mamma, Mr. Dunn is like that horse. Nonsense, Jemima, you must not say so. I don't know what your father would say if he heard you likening Mr. Dunn to a brute. Brutes are sometimes very beautiful, mamma. I am sure I should think it a compliment to be likened to a racehorse, such as the one we saw. But the thing in which they are alike is the sort of repressed eagerness in both. Eager? Why, I should say there never was any one cooler than Mr. Dunn. Think of the trouble your papa had this month past, and then remember the slow way in which Mr. Dunn moves when he is going out to canvas, and the low, drawling voice in which he questions the people who bring him intelligence. I can see your papa standing by, ready to shake them to get out their news. But Mr. Dunn's questions are always to the point, and force out the grain without the chaff and look at him if any one tells him ill news about the election. Have you never seen a dull red light come into his eyes? That is like my racehorse. Her flesh quivered all over at certain sounds and noises which had some meaning to her, but she stood quite still, pretty creature. Now, Mr. Dunn is just as eager as she was, though he may be too proud to show it, though he seems so gentle. I almost think he is very headstrong in following out his own will. Well, don't call him like a horse again, for I am sure papa would not like it. Do you know, I thought you were going to say he was like little Leonard when you asked me who he was like. Leonard? Oh, mamma, he is not in the least like Leonard. He is twenty times more like my racehorse. Now, my dear Jemima, do be quiet. Your father thinks racing so wrong that I am sure he would be very seriously displeased if he were to hear you. To return to Mr. Bradshaw, and to give one more of his various reasons for wishing to take Mr. Dunn to Abermouth, the wealthy Eccleston manufacturer was uncomfortably impressed with an indefinable sense of inferiority to his visitor. It was not in education, for Mr. Bradshaw was a well-educated man. It was not in power, for, if he chose, the present object of Mr. Dunn's life might be utterly defeated. It did not arise from anything overbearing in manner, for Mr. Dunn was habitually polite and courteous, and was just now anxious to propitiate his host, whom he looked upon as a very useful man. Whatever this sense of inferiority arose from, Mr. Bradshaw was anxious to relieve himself from it, and imagined that if he could make more display of his wealth, his object would be obtained. Now his house in Eccleston was old-fashioned and ill-calculated to exhibit money's worth. His mode of living, though strained to a high pitch just at this time, he became aware was no more than Mr. Dunn was accustomed to every day of his life. The first day, at dessert, some remark, some opportune remark, as Mr. Bradshaw, in his innocence, had thought, was made regarding the price of pineapples, which was rather exorbitant that year, and Mr. Dunn asked Mrs. Bradshaw, with quiet surprise, if they had no pinery, as if to be without a pinery were indeed a depth of pitiable destitution. In fact, Mr. Dunn had been born and cradled in all that wealth could purchase, and so had his ancestors before him for so many generations, that refinement and luxury seemed the natural condition of man, and they that dwelt without were in the position of monsters. The absence was noticed, but not the presence. Now, Mr. Bradshaw knew that the house and grounds of Eagle's Crag were exorbitantly dear, and yet he really thought of purchasing them. And as one means of exhibiting his wealth, and so raising himself up to the level of Mr. Dunn, he thought that if he could take the ladder down to Abermouth, and show him the place for which, because his little girls had taken a fancy to it, he was willing to give the fancy price of fourteen thousand pounds, he should 
at last make those half-shut dreamy eyes open wide and their owner confess that in wealth at least the eccleston manufacturer stood on a par with him all these mingled motives caused the determination which made ruth sit in the little inn parlour of abermouth during the wild storm's passage she wondered if she had fulfilled all mr bradshaw's directions she looked at the letter yes everything was done and now home with her news through the wet lane where the little pools by the roadside reflected the deep blue sky and the round white clouds with even deeper blue and clearer white and the raindrops hung so thick on the trees that even a little bird's flight was enough to shake them down in a bright shower as of rain when she told the news mary exclaimed oh how charming then we shall see this new member after all while elizabeth added yes i shall like to do that but where must we be papa will want the dining-room and this room and where must we sit oh said ruth in the dressing-room next to my room all that your papa wants always is that you are quiet and out of the way end of chapter twenty two